George Bernard Shaw had it all wrong. Youth is not wasted on the young. As we will hear in this podcast, our final podcast of the season, we'll start with the story of a young man from the Kootenays who had a dream. A dream he refused to let go of. Dryden Hunt was born in Cranbrook and raised in Nelson. He wanted to be a professional hockey player, to play in the NHL, like so many Canadian kids. And young Dryden had talent. He played for the Kootenay Ice under-18 squad and very briefly the famed Trail Smoke Eaters before being called up to the WHL, the Western Hockey League, one step away from his NHL dream. At first, Hunt struggled in the WHL and made almost no mark. He rarely found the net in season one. Then, missed his entire second season because of concussions. A disastrous start. Dryden did eventually find his stride, began scoring and getting attention toward the end of his WHL career. But not the kind of attention he needed to make the NHL. He went to pro camps, then watched with disappointment as other younger players were selected. Soon he was the oldest player on his junior team and was about to age out of the WHL, meaning his professional hockey career was about to end. Dryden's mother is an acquaintance of mine and told me back then it was a stressful time for her son, for the whole family. A dream was fading, and he didn't really have a plan B. Then, toward the end of his final WHL season, Dryden went out one night and scored a hat trick. Down goes to the backhand, shoots, and he scores! Dryden Hunt ties the game 1-1. A hat trick is a rare thing for a hockey player. Three goals in one game. Some players will spend an entire career without even getting one. Next game, young Dryden went out and scored another hat trick. Incredible. Six goals in two games. The Scootney kid was on a tear. And it was just the beginning. During that cold February on the prairies, Dryden Hunt played like he was possessed by the ghost of Roquette Richard. He got so hot and scored so many goals, it was impossible not to notice. Four hat-tricks in five games. An unprecedented, unbelievable run. No one had seen such a thing in junior hockey. Dryden Hunt was daring the NHL to pass him by yet again. Which, of course, they didn't. It's all the way to the net. Puts it in front and there it is! Dryden Hunt's first NHL goal! It was a matter of time and Hunt slams it home. Save that puck. I don't know of any young man that has given more to get his first goal in the NHL. Mitchell Scott, Editor-in-Chief of Kootenai Mountain Culture Magazine, and this is The Headwaters, brought to you by Columbia Basin Trust. On this podcast, we're going to meet young people, teenagers in the basin who are doing truly incredible things. The types of things that make you stop and go, you're doing what? And you're how old? It's a podcast dedicated to youth in the Columbia Basin. And we're going to start with a girl from Fernie who's just into her teens and is already making music with rock stars. It's one of those tales that's almost hard to believe, as our Jamie Moy found out. Yes, Mitch, let's head into the town of Fernie in the home of the Smith family. That's where we'll meet 14-year-old Nell Smith and her dad, Jude. Nell had quite a time over the pandemic, but I'm going to let her describe it. Hey, you must be Nell. Nice to meet you. Jude? Hi, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. No worries. You're welcome. So Nell, is there a quiet place we can go talk? Yeah, we could go up to my bedroom. All right, let's go. <laughs> oh, who's this guy? This is Colin, my cat. So there I am, Mitch, in Nell Smith's room with Colin, her cat, purring away. Nell's 14, so the room looks like a regular teenager's room. The posters, the unmade bed. But the main difference between her room and my teenage kids' rooms was the instruments. There's guitars, multiple guitars, hanging on the wall, in the corner. 
So first, I got Nell to pick up one of those guitars and strum a tune, you know, Mitch, to get to know her a little before we talk about her crazy, amazing adventure during the pandemic. Yeah, this is way out of tune. I haven't played in forever. <laughs> Tell me, what's what's with all these guitars? <laughs> well, I play guitar, but these guitars have, like, meaning to them. So this one I got from my dad's friend, Troy Cook, who lives in town. And he's an artist. And he is suffering from cancer. And this other one, I played uh, the song that I wrote for Troy to Wayne and Steven from the Flaming Lips. Okay, Mitch, we're going to jump right into the Flaming Lips and Nell's unbelievable journey. Are you familiar with the Lips? Somewhat. Old school rock band with crazy light show, right? Yeah, kind of. The Flaming Lips are a band out of Oklahoma you might call an experimental, psychedelic rock band. They kind of defy description. The Lips have been going for four decades, have won four Grammys, and pretty much invented a certain kind of rock show. You have to see it to believe it. A Lips show is like no other show on earth because I'm pretty sure they're not from this planet. At a lip show, the lead singer Wayne Coyne may just ride out on a horse. Or on the shoulders of a guy in a gorilla suit. Lead singer on a horse on stage. Or he could come out in a giant bubble that rolls over the audience. Or everyone in the audience might be asked to watch from inside their own personal bubble. He did that during the pandemic. You can expect balloons, thousands of them, confetti, cannons of confetti. You just don't know what the lips are going to do next. And that's why people love them. It's part rock show, Mitch. Part Broadway show. Part ticker tape parade, it's madness. And the leader of this mayhem is 61-year-old Wayne Coyne. He's fronted this band since he was barely out of his teens. And they still fill up halls all over the world. I think I would have rather worn a bubble than a mask anyway. But I (laughs) I take it Nell Smith must just love the Flaming Lips. Nell Smith loves the Lips. And she has since she was a little kid. Let's head back to Earth and Fernie and meet her dad for more on her Flaming Lips obsession. Do you want a cup of tea or a coffee or something? Yeah, tea would be great. Nell has always shown an interest in music, and um, I'm a I'm a big music fan. I play music all the time, and Nell just latched on to the Flaming Lips. Nell was ten, I think, and there was a show in Spokane. And so we got tickets to the show, and um, it's quite funny, actually. She now burst into tears when we told her that we, we had tickets to go and see him. It was really cute. She'd hate me to uh, to say that, but I was saying it anyway. But, because um, she was so excited. Oh, she was so excited. She was just beyond ecstatic. It was just, she she just couldn't believe that we, she was going to go and see this band that she just, yeah... So that so that was fun. So we went to see them down there, and she just loved it. She was in the front row, singing all the songs, and like getting pounded with confetti. And she just it just kind of blew her mind. It was really nice. So if you've ever been to a Flaming Lips concert, they're very like crazy. <laughs> There's like lots of costumes and like balloons, and it's really interactive and stuff. And my dad told me this before we went to my first show. And so we found this crazy outfit. It was a parrot costume. So there's this little kid in a parrot costume, belting out every word. She was so enthralled by the experience that her parents took her to another show 18 months later, also in the States. And then as a treat to a third show in Calgary on the same tour, just a week later. Now by this time, Wayne Coy notices this kid in a parrot costume following the band. There's this video you've got to see, Mitch. It's Wayne Coyne doing a David Bowie cover inside this giant bubble with Nell on the outside, hands pressed up against it, singing back every word at him. It's at the Calgary show. 
And that show is where the family met Wayne Coyne for the first time. So we went to Calgary and we got into the venue and Nell went and stationed herself at the side of the stage because she wanted to she wanted to get Wayne's autograph or something and she noticed that he <laughs> he'd gone like he'd go on stage and kind of help get set up. He's very hands on. And um so she saw him coming onto the stage and she yelled at him and he heard her and he came over and uh just was like started chatting to him we we noticed so we went across and he was he was just chatting to her and he he'd recognized her from from the week before wow so he recognized her from the week before and then Nell told him that she'd written a she'd written a, a letter and she'd given it to a roadie and he roadie had taken it on the tour bus and and Wayne being Wayne was just like oh let me go I'll go get it I'll go get it and and he said just give me your number <laughs> and so so I gave him my number and um and we we thought oh well, that's you know that's that was that was fun we got a photo with him and all this kind of stuff and Nell has those photos um and um and then 10 minutes later he texted us and he texted a, texted us a picture of him with the letter and he was like what a cool letter and he had a she'd drawn a picture and all this kind of stuff and so oh, way and so he was just, yeah, that, and that's kind of how it all started. What started, Mitch, is a relationship between this family in Fernie and this band in Oklahoma. Nell was so taken by Wayne and the Lips, she started writing songs and sending them to the band. And they were encouraging, really encouraging. In fact, Wayne suggested they collaborate on some songs with Nell recording in Fernie and the Flaming Lips polishing the songs back in Oklahoma. This is a crazy story. There's a little girl in Fernie, a pair of costume bubbles, and now she's singing with an international rock star. Yeah, and they start working on an album full of songs. Wayne wants Nella to polish her own songwriting, so he's choosing cover songs of another singer named Nick Cave for them to record together. Nick Cave goes back to the 80s as well. He croons out these really dark, really beautiful songs about love and death, Nick Cave shows are as legendary as Flaming Lip shows. And now here's this 14-year-old singing these haunting songs in her bedroom. They decided they're going to cut a full album together in Oklahoma, but the pandemic killed that idea. So they start swapping recording files virtually. I'm going to let Nell pick the story back up in her room. COVID hit, and the pandemic started, so we couldn't actually, like, travel. And so... Wayne had this idea, he wanted to hear me sing this other song, it was Into My Arms by Nick Cave, and so we recorded that, and we had no intention of making an album, but after that he's like, I like, I looked at some other Nick Cave songs, and we ended up recording them, and they just like, turned into an album. <laughs> Did you even know Nick Cave's music before that? Um, I actually didn't, I was introduced to it when Wayne told me about it, and then I listened to some other Nick Cave songs and some of his albums after I first heard of him. And then, like, we just picked a couple songs off of certain albums and then, yeah, we, like, recorded them. I don't believe in an interventionist So she's made this record with a world-famous rock star after a chance meeting in Calgary. What happens next? This happens. And now performing Red Right Hand from their Nick Cave covers album, Where the Viaduct Looms, Nell and the Flaming Lips. Oh my goodness, Stephen Colbert. Yes, it was. In January, Nell's already been on Colbert, and she's setting up tours with the Lips and living a life her family could not have imagined just a year ago. She's kind of becoming a rock star at 14. Not quite Billie Eilish yet, but fame, or at least a career, might be just around the corner. And all because of this one chance meeting. It's absolutely nuts. 
Let's hear from Jude and Nell once more. She wants to go to a music school. And so she's just going to keep doing what she's doing. And I hope that this has been like this serendipitous, crazy, mind-blowing experience is, is going to lead to her being able to do that if that's what she really wants to do. Some go on, some stay behind, some So I was wondering, too, what you think of Wayne now. I mean, he was someone on a stage to you, a rock star, and now he is almost like a friend, or what would you call him? Um, I think that Wayne is definitely, yeah, he's like a, a mentor to me, and I think, like, I've hung out with his son and his wife, and I've got to know, like, the rest of the band members, and I think that I would call Wayne, like, a mentor a friend, a role model. What a story. Talk about chasing dreams. The type of fame you might read about in a newspaper. And I've got teenagers home. If there's one complaint I've got is that you can't get them to stop reading a newspaper. Okay, not really. When was the last time you actually saw someone under 30 turning the pages of a newspaper? But that is changing somewhat for Kootenai Youth. In true throwback fashion, they've started their own newspaper, Kootenai Teen News. Graham Tracy's got a couple teens of his own and had to have a look for himself. Okay, Ava, this is our second issue. Did you know it was going to be on the front cover? Did I tell I you that? I don't think I did. Kootenai Teen News editor Melody Ray Story proofreads an unedited version of the latest paper. Pointing out to one of her star reporters, she nabbed the front page. I think it looks so professional, which, <laughs> I don't know, it's very cool to see, like, the front page. That was my story, and I wrote yeah. that, and now it's like, it looks so professional, and, you know, the paper quality, and the print and everything it looks like a real i mean it is a real newspaper <laughs> and i just think I, yeah i think it looks amazing the kootenai teen news is a passion project for story who is the teen and literary services coordinator at the nelson library it turns out story loves well stories and the newspapers that contain them oh 100 <laughs> percent satisfied my inner high school nerd who always wanted to be on a newspaper team <laughs> And so, during the pandemic, Story began building a paper written exclusively by Kootenai teenagers, a labor of love. Because I always wanted to be a part of a high school newspaper when I was in high school, but we didn't have that. Um, and then the pandemic hit, and I was really looking for something that could be done virtually across a broad geographical region, because I was thinking of involving the whole Kootenais. And so the two kind of came together, and I was like, this is the time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Story taught herself newspaper layout software and how to edit. Then she began recruiting. Her young journalists, photographers, and artists are spread across the Kootenays and its 20 or so libraries. They contribute almost exclusively online. I'm really encouraging teens to write commentary because I think their opinions are so interesting. So a lot of it is commentary, editorial kind of, kind of thing. Uh, we always have at least one interview, like so a feature on someone, and then a few news stories about resources or activities that are happening in different communities. Story says there's about 30 teens interested in contributing, or currently writing, doing the art, and taking photos. 15-year-old Ava Wall is one of them. I've always had a passion for writing. I've always been very interested in writing fiction. I write poetry and a lot of short stories. I enter a lot of writing competitions. So I wanted to expand my skills by looking into nonfiction and journalism and kind of the different writing styles that I hadn't tried yet. Uh, my parents are both former journalists, so they were very encouraging of that. And I am also very big on activism and on highlighting teen voices and highlighting diverse voices. So I think that this just struck me as like the perfect opportunity to showcase my own voice. Wall has contributed two pieces to Kootenai Teen News and says it was a marvelous experience. I think I'm definitely considering creative writing as a career path. Maybe not specifically journalism, but I think that being able to write all of the different like parts of writing so you know journalism and being able to do persuasive essays and all of that stuff I think is going to be really beneficial in any career involving English or involving writing. Um, so the things that I need to do for this edition I'm gonna add a table of contents because apparently 
all these papers have that. Cool. And I'm going to clean up my headlines, make them better, actually include a headline here. The first editions of Kootenai and Teen News came out early in the new year. It's a four-page tabloid-style paper. But Melody Ray's story hopes to expand it and go to color at some point. She says it's not all teens reading it. I think there's a lot adult readers could get from reading Kootenai Teen News. There's something about teens that they don't have the baggage that us adults have. And their their views on the world are so fresh and interesting. Um, so I just encourage you to read Kootenai Teen News with an open mind and see what comes up for you. Story says there's about 300 people reading Kootenai Teen News online. And surprisingly, about the same number reading the print version. It does feel very retro. But you know what? It's interesting because one teen told me that the news is not made for them. And so he really liked the idea of the newspaper because he wants to read about what is actually happening in the lives of Kootenai teens, you know. And I don't believe that newspapers are dead. Like, I personally don't. And I I feel like local journalism will always have um, a place in our lives. I think it's just about our voices being showcased. I think that I'm always looking for opportunities to be a part of change in the community or be a part of discussion in the community, and there aren't really a lot of opportunities for that. And it's a very simple way that you can showcase your voice and you can highlight other people's voices and be a part of a community that is working for something. Wow, that is one articulate 15-year-old. The kids are all right. I have no doubt I'm going to be reading something Ava's written in the future. We're going to have to give you a warning about this next teen. Um, She's going to make you feel like a bit of a couch potato. Tula Shercat is a straight-A student, just graduated from high school in Nelson. She's also into performance dance and is a conservatory-level piano player. That's her on the keys. But that's just the beginning. Tula also competes at the international level in competitive rock climbing, which is what she wants to make her career out of. We're going to leave the last word with Tula Shercat. So I started playing when I was super young, and I I don't know the age, but I'd say three or four generally. Um, And then when I got a bit older, I started playing at the Royal Conservatory level and started doing exams. And then I've taken some breaks throughout the years, and then I've always come back to it. Piano, it's more just of like a creative outlet for me at this point. It's just another way to to express myself in art, I guess. Um, Yeah, and it's just, it's something that I've always done. And then Usually, if I'll, I'll take a break from, from something and either I'll come back to it or I won't. And it's always been something that's, it's like sitting in the side of my house. I'm like, oh, I should play again and then get back into it. So I've been climbing since I can remember. Like my very first memory is at the Gravity Climbing Center that used to be in town here Um, and then I started competing when I was about eight years old so next year I'm hoping to compete again and finish my youth climbing career and then depending on how that goes if I can balance school and life and climbing and training at that level that I would need to be at um, if that all goes forwards hopefully make the national team which would be then the gateway to world cups and championships and the olympics I'd like to be a professional climber, a World Cup climbing athlete, I guess that's the phrase that I would use, because that's where I can kind of inspire people, I guess. And you you can do that at Olympics, you can kind of do that at any level, but for me, like, I grew up watching climbing competitions, and so I know all the big names from that, kind of, um, before climbing was an Olympic sport. And so to be, I guess, to be an athlete that like someone can look at and watch on screen and be like I want to do that like that that's kind of the end goal for me would be to be able to inspire at least one person to want to climb and like follow their passion of something And 
that's our podcast, our final episode of season one. And I got to say, it's been a real blast. The Headwaters is produced by Kootenai Mountain Culture Magazine and brought to you by Columbia Basin Trust. Columbia Basin Trust supports the efforts of people and communities in the Columbia Basin. Learn more at OurTrust.org. Bob Keating writes, edits, and produces The Headwaters. He's done an incredible job. In full disclosure, some of the personal stories you heard off the top of the podcast are from Bob's life. Some are from mine. You can figure out which is which. Tara Cunningham and Vince Hempsall are our story editors for the podcast. Peter Moynes is one of our producers and our photo editor. Stacy Michowski does our design work and Jesse Lee, all the fabulous custom music. Our reporters were Jamie Moy and Graham Tracy, and I'm Mitchell Scott. Thanks for listening to The Headwaters. If you want to find out more about all of our episodes, visit headwaterspodcast.com. Mm-hmm.